Hi, good day everyone. Thank you for joining us at this online event on the topic of explainable AI in healthcare brought to you by SG Innovate, the Netherlands Embassy in Singapore, as well as the Netherlands AI Coalition. My name is Tuan from SG Innovate. As a Singapore government-backed investor, we have been building up and driving deep tech innovations in AI, blockchain, quantum tech, autonomous driving cars across various industries. And over the past couple of years, as we invest in startups, build talent, work with scientists and researchers across various fields, we realize that healthcare is a big domain where AI and deep technologies are having the most impact in transforming the way healthcare services are being delivered. Over the past couple of years as well, we noticed that the conversation has shifted from what technology can do to how technology should be used responsibly to improve healthcare services and patient outcomes. Many of today's AI diagnosis tools function as what the market would call black boxes, offering little explanation on why the machine thinks that a particular patient has a certain disease. This may result in the low deployment of AI in healthcare as the black box AI model does not help to build trust or accountability among clinicians and patients. There is an emerging focus, therefore, on the new model of explainable AI, which can be helpful in addressing this issue. And that is why we want to convene today's conversation, bringing together industry leaders from the Netherlands and Singapore to address how explainable AI could be helpful to promote more usage of AI in medical treatments and innovation across the board. So I hope that you will be engaging in the conversation with our speakers today and submitting all the questions that you could have uh, as the event progresses. At the moment, I would now like to invite our partner, Astrid, who is the Head of Science, Technology and Innovation at the Netherlands Embassy, to also say a few words. Astrid, please. Thank you, Tuan. Uh, well, it's nice to uh, well, much actually see you all, uh, but happy to have you all here digitally. Uh, uh, I'm very happy uh, uh, to have such a uh, diverse uh, audience uh, here with us today, and very grateful uh, for the partnership with SD Innovate and the Dutch AI Coalition. Uh, this is our first event uh, on AI. Uh, via this digital platform, uh, and we have a few uh, other events lined up, so a first in, in this series. Um, I work for the Netherlands Embassy for the Netherlands Innovation Network, uh, and we, our department has the aim uh, to foster R&D collaborations between Singapore and Netherlands uh, companies, universities, and, and government. And we have found uh, great support uh, with FG Innovate in the past, uh, 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 so uh, I'm happy to, uh, to continue that. I just wanted to uh, briefly highlight uh, current uh, a global stars call uh, that uh, might be interesting for some of the attendants here today. Uh, this is uh, funding support for R&D collaborations between companies in Singapore and the Netherlands. We will share uh, more about this uh, funding opportunity also uh, via a follow-up email, but I would very much like to encourage you, if you have a project idea, to upload it there in the virtual marketplace. Uh, well, I don't have anything more to say, just looking forward to this crash course uh, in explainable AI. Uh, so, uh, so, Chris, uh, over to you. Thank you. To the host, first of all, I think how great it is that we can be able to share uh, internationally like this, perhaps a, a benefit of the situation we all, all find ourselves in. So that's very exciting. I thank to all the people who have joined today because I know there's a lot of webinars and a lot of demands on your time. I think at last count we had 350 registrations or something to that effect. So just fantastic to see all the interest on this topic. My name is Chris Hardesty. I'm the director of KPMG's Healthcare and Life Sciences Practice. So I'm based in Singapore, but working across the Asia Pacific uh, and globally. And before we jump into the content, I'll just make a few uh, quick remarks. So I was reflecting, you know, on this topic and, uh, and on this discussion. And here we find ourselves six months in to the pandemic situation globally. And one thing that I've said in these forums before, and I, and I still, you know, truly believe it as a personal belief, is that a, a positive outcome of this pandemic is that the average 
health literacy in society is going to go up quite a bit as people are more attuned to healthcare. And also, I think many organizations, if they weren't involved in healthcare before for their own employees, for external stakeholders, we'll see a lot more organizations getting involved in healthcare too. So that's all very exciting. And I think equally on the part of AI, whether you define that as artificial intelligence or augmented intelligence or algorithms, we've discussed this, its applications for a long time in healthcare. And now we are starting to see an acceleration of these concepts uh, during this, this situation too. So if we look at these sort of two things in parallel, healthcare and AI, I mean, a lot of my personal work and, and for those, for example, joining from the Netherlands, you'll be familiar with uh, the concepts of health as a basic human right. I mean, in most parts of the world, this is a, a fundamental principle of countries. So how do you provide access to care and coverage for care as a basic human right for people? And the discussion today will be thinking along those lines from an AI perspective. So what are the basic human rights in AI and, and especially explainable AI as Tuan you know, talked about at the beginning? So what should the average person understand? What should patients understand, doctors, others involved in the healthcare ecosystem about the AI that's being used? so as to ensure a high level of trust in the way that health systems uh, operate. On the other end, you have a concept like infobesity, which is an, an inundation of information, right? So I think one thing we'll talk about today is where is that appropriate line between explainable AI versus too much information that people can't comprehend? And one thing I agreed with the panelists today is we've got some prepared discussion prompts, but we really want to make this an interactive format for the people joining. So please do put in your questions. We'll take them straight away. Uh, you know, if there are no questions, we can go back to our discussion prompts. But I think my, my guess is people out there have some interesting questions and comments to, to put forth. So please do, and we'll take them uh, straight away. So the way this is going to work, we're going to have each panelist make a few remarks about the way that they're looking at the world here, and then uh, we will jump into the interactive portion. Before that, we're going to run our first audience poll. So Jody, if you can pull that up here for people. I think we've got a good mix today of uh, academia, researchers, government, investors, corporate startups. So just trying to get an extent of, you know, to what degree the people joining today are already using the concepts of AI in your work. And again, however you define AI uh, is up to you, but ho hopefully the question is, is uh, clear enough. So just take a few seconds and fill that out, please. Few more seconds. Okay, Jody, can you show the results? All right, so a good platform to build off here for our panelists. We have majority of people that are using AI every single day in some shape or form. And again, if you've got comments or questions about this work that you're doing, please put that in the Q and A. Um, so, you know, most people are, are either picking it up or using it on a daily basis. So that, that's a good platform for us to start off with. Okay. You can close the poll. Uh, Jordan. And so again, the way this will work, we'll have each panelist make a few remarks and then we'll get into the discussion. Uh, so with that, let me call the first panelist. So professor Niesen, he's a professor of biomedical imaging analysis and machine learning at the Erasmus medical center in the Netherlands. He's also the founder of an AI imaging company called Quantib. So, Professor Niesen, over to you. Thank you very much, Chris. It's a pleasure to uh, uh, discuss today about this uh, very important topic about explainable AI. So, um, my first uh, comment is the question is, uh, is AI really uh, um, not, not explainable to begin with? So, AI, of course, is sort of an umbrella term and there's different forms of AI. I myself work in the field of trying to get most information out of imaging data and combine it with other information in order to improve diagnosis, prognosis, select the right therapy. And we have a, a lot of AI tools at our disposal and most of them are in, in the field of, of learning, machine learning. And then we of course have deep learning, but we also have the more conventional machine learning. The field which is for example important in oncology is radiomics in which we compute a number of features around the tumor and then let the computer decide based on a number of examples which combination of features is most 
informative about the subtype of tumor or the success of a certain type of treatment. Now, in this case, you have a number of engineered features and you can uh, provide information which features were important to come to a certain diagnosis, which makes it possible to uh, the algorithm to explain to the user, I come to a certain uh, conclusion, and it is these types of features that are, of the tumor that have made me think of this, this, uh, uh, this decision. If you think of deep learning, deep learning is really, of course, a high dimensional uh, problem. You, you link input to output. Input can be complex or simple. Output can be complex or simple. And the layers in between can be very deep. So you're, you, you have really a lot of parameters that you optimize based on examples. And then it seems that such an enormous network is a, is a black box. But actually we learn a lot from a black box. So the first statement I would like to make is that we learn a lot from these algorithms. For example, we developed based on more than 5,000 scans of the brain, a deep learning algorithm to uh, try to estimate the age of a person. And uh, we use that now as uh, trying to predict the chance of someone getting cognitive decline or dementia. And we can actually trace back uh, the, the, this neural network and see which regions of the image were important in order to estimate the age of a person. So this gives us actually insight in what parts of the brain uh, changes occur due to aging or abnormal aging leading to dementia. So sometimes these AI algorithms are quite insightful. We have the same with genetic algorithms. We take genetic data as input in order to predict schizophrenia and we find genetic variations that give an increased chance uh, on, on, on getting schizophrenia. So these deep learning networks can give insight. They do that by visualizing which information is important. And I think this is the key for explainable AI. In the end, what we need to do is to, deter, to define interfaces between human intelligence and AI. We need the algorithm to communicate what parts of the image or what part of the data were important in the discussion. We need the, the, the people using the algorithm to be able to interact with these visualizations in order to understand what the algorithm is doing. As a last statement, I would like to indicate that perhaps we not always need explainability. If an algorithm does its work well, if you have a self-driving car and it just doesn't go off the road, if we have an algorithm that does a perfect job, but we cannot really explain how it's doing it, will we not use it? I think at the moment, uh, a problem of a lot of algorithms is they're not explainable and they've not been validated properly. But if we think of a proper validation and we know in certain circumstances algorithms really work well, maybe we will accept to use them in a medical practice even if they're not explainable. And uh, I think if you critically look at medicine, we're doing a lot of things in which we have the evidence of validation studies, but we do not exactly know why a certain thing works or not. If we do a randomized clinical trial, uh, a priori, we do not understand the outcome of the trial. If we've seen the outcome and we know what is best, we go for a certain solution, even though sometimes we do not fully understand why this is the best solution. So I think explainability is important, especially because algorithms are not perfect and we need quality control, but perhaps it's not always a necessity. And I uh, look forward to discuss uh, some of these issues with you further in this uh, seminar. Many thanks, Professor, uh, for, those, for those opening remarks. I, I did promise the audience that as they had questions, we would take them. So maybe I'd do a quick one for you and then, then we just keep it going here. So we'll try and keep our kind of answer brief, but perhaps wearing your uh, founder hat here, got a lot of startups. Uh, so one of the questions is um, weighing the benefits of AI imaging solutions against the sort of cost or investment. So any, any, any initial thought there? And, and again, we can keep it kind of brief and, and keep the panel going, but, but any initial thoughts there from you? Yeah, so I think at the end, the, 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 there's an enormous benefit in, in, in making the right diagnosis or prognosis. So provided that you uh, develop algorithms with, with data that are uh, reflecting uh, the, the reality in clinical practice, we can really, uh, uh, really improve the accuracy and efficiency of care. So I think in the end, uh, uh, I think in a, a number of years, it will become irresponsible not to make use of these technologies in order to improve the quality and accessibility of care. Thank you. 
Okay, well, let's keep it going with the intro comments here. So I'd like to call on our next guest from the Netherlands, uh, Professor Iskam. She's a professor of AI medical imaging at the Amsterdam University Medical Center. Uh, she also has a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit because she founded what's called the Medical Imaging and Deep Learning uh, Forum Tube. So Professor Iskam, over to you for some comments. So, um... In implementation of AI, uh, it is important in, in, in implementation of AI in healthcare, it is important to give people a feeling that they can trust the software that they use. And uh, automation uh, of an expert analysis uh, may cause errors and these errors will cause clinical errors which are important uh, for safety in healthcare. So, um, the options are here determining the uncertainty uh, which can be used as a proxy of, well, not really interpretability, but indicating where the errors are and giving people a feeling of trust. Then interpretability, which will explain decisions, how the network has made the decisions, or interpretability of uncertainty. So by far, until now, uh, in, uh, uncertainty has been uh, investigated the most. Um, so we can ask the network, uh, we can look at the output, uh, and see whether it corresponds to the errors that have been made. Um, for example, we have done this with cardiovascular image segmentation, where we have seen that uh, areas of, auto, of errors that aut automation has produced do correspond with uh, areas where the networks are uncertain. But in some cases, this doesn't work. Uh, in cases where the images are synthesized, uh, for example, where the outputs of the networks are continuous and generate uh, image values, uh, um, outputs don't say anything about uncertainty. So there, like in real life, you would, uh, in many cases, we could ask experts, number of experts for an opinion, and in cases where they agree, we would say the decision is uh, certain, where they disagree, uh, uh, we, this would be area of low uncertainty. So this has been done with networks as well, um, in, ma in many applications, in, in image analysis and uh, in uh, uh, planning uh, treatments um, uh, in synthesis of images. Um, interpretability is about um, explaining the conclusions of a network. So uh, as Professor uh, Nisa said, um, it is not always necessary to dis explain everything uh, at the deepest level. Uh, so visualization, for example, can be useful for assessing uh, the um, model interpretation. So we can visualize the, net, uh, the areas uh, where uh, the, uh, the network is looking at. Um, for example, a network can make a decision and we can retrospectively look uh, where the uh, areas of activation are. So for example, uh, if we, we have uh, uh, developed a method where we quantify something from an image, of course, this can cause a distrust because the expert doesn't have a feeling of where the decision is coming from. So we could look at activation areas and if they respond, correspond to the areas uh, of lesions, uh, that can give a feeling uh, to an expert of interpretability and the trust that this de decision uh, uh, has been made on the correct basis. Um, we can of course also visualize the features, but the fact remains that many of the features uh, don't correspond to the images uh, or we cannot interpret them. They, 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 they don't uh, um, correspond to what we would maybe expect to see. Um, and of course, the ideal would be uh, to look at attributes. Uh, so for example, if the network would say, well, this is an organ that is in between the lungs and the bubble stomach, it must be uh, in heart. Um, in healthcare and medical imaging, we cannot do this. There are publications which demonstrate that in uh, analysis of natural images, this can be done. Um, but uh, in, in those cases, uh, millions and millions of labeled images are available. And in healthcare and medical imaging, we don't have that. And uh, the data that we learn from is orders of magnitude smaller. And so far, uh, it doesn't work. Um, so uncertainty estimations can help us spotting the errors that has been shown and it works quite well, I would say. Uh, fully interpretable um, and networks do not yet exist. There are some really good results in uh, analysis of natural images, but not yet in healthcare. Um, and um, 
I don't think that we will have that anytime really soon in the implementation. But um, I also don't think that this is fully necessary. I think analysis of errors, uh, good evaluations can also tell us a lot about the performance and give trust uh, and lead to implementation in, in, in clinic. Great, thank you. Um, and I'll go ahead and direct a question to you as well. So there's a couple of questions coming in here and I think it's somewhat related to, to what you were talking about. I'm gonna rephrase it slightly so it's a bit more pointed so we can keep things moving along. But as it pertains to the quality validation of the deep learning solutions that are, that are in your work being applied to healthcare, is there any particular standards sort of body or, or organization that, that currently is set up to govern this? Well, in, in research settings, there are standard um, measures, more or less, uh, depend, they're, they're task dependent. Um, so uh, uh, for, some, for certain type of tasks, there are standard measures that are used in science that, uh, that are used. Um, but evaluation um, on, is typically limited to relatively small and homogeneous data sets, and that is related to availability of the data. Uh, in healthcare, uh, in medical imaging and healthcare in general, sharing data on large scale is uh, still unfortunately a limitation. And I think the evaluation uh, issue or problems regarding evaluation come to that. Um, in uh, commercialization of software, there are also procedures that are uh, imposed by regulatory bodies, uh, 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 certification, in obtaining certification. There are procedures in which uh, performance has to be shown. Okay, thank you. And again, we can dig into some of these topics a bit more uh, during the open discussion too. All right, last but not least, we've got uh, Dr. Ting. He is a practicing surgeon at the Singapore uh, National Eye Center. In fact, I think he's just come off of a surgery. He's still, uh, still, still dressed there. So thanks a lot for joining us. But at the same time, he's also the head of AI and digital innovation at the Singapore Eye Research Institute. So a kind of interesting double role there. Uh, Dr. Ting, maybe some comments from you. And I, I think you were gonna share, share something on the screen. So you might have to do that from your end if, if you're able to. Okay, thanks, Chris. Yeah, thanks for um, the kind invitation for me to speak. Um, yeah, like Chris has just said, I just uh, stepped out from the OT. And uh, without further ado, um, let me just uh, share some slides. Uh, I was just uh, was, uh, telling Tuan, Tuan that um, um, I'm just, uh, you know, trying to over prepare like a Singapore style, like the Asian way. Um, so, I mean, for the next five minutes, I'm just going to uh, take a, just a step back a little because I do understand the audience actually um, does, um, you know, have um, uh, varying backgrounds in terms of the AI, deep learning and stuff. So I, I try to do it from a more like a clinic, clinical perspective. Um, so to speak, and uh, in a more layman uh, manner. So yeah, so I'm, uh, as Chris has uh, just uh, kindly introduced, um, I'm currently heading the uh, AI and Digital Innovation Group in the uh, Singapore Eye Research Institute. And I'm currently also visiting uh, China, um, the Eye Institute uh, to be the adjunct uh, faculty there as well. So these are some of my affiliations. Uh, we have co-founded a company uh, looking at deep learning system in retinal diseases. Um, currently I'm carrying um, some um, global uh, scientific advisory roles and as well as the, um, the associate editorship in Nature Digital Medicine and Frontiers in Medicine and a couple of the exco in the AI, AI task force, as well as the, uh, the start AI, which is one of the uh, regulatory and the governance, um, you know, for AI uh, policy guidelines and stuff. So, I mean, as uh, everyone is um, aware, AI is nothing new. I mean, it's been uh, coined since uh, back in 1950s. And the new kid in the block is really the deep learning that's been actually described 10 years ago. So basically, if you want to talk about deep learning and you cannot uh, get away from these three big giants, so Yen Le Kuhn, Joshua Banjo, as well as uh, uh, Jeffrey Hinton, they are actually deemed to be the godfather in deep learning. And uh, jointly, they actually published this nature, uh, the publications. And if I actually, um, for, for the audience who actually really want to learn about deep learning, I would strongly, uh, highly encourage you guys to actually take a read because so far it's been cited more than 27,000 times and basically in the uh, publication itself it states that deep learning should allow uh, uh, allows all the um 
the data to be analyzed by multiple processing layers with multiple level of abstractions that really um, that actually span across the speech recognition, image recognition, natural language processing, and et cetera. I mean, if you look at uh, coming back to the healthcare setting, if you look at the deep learning research, there's a big search of the, you know, the AI uh, research over the last five years. Um, in a few across different tasks and different subspecialties. And this is some of the AI publication that we are actually done in the Singapore Eye Research Institute. Um, so I mean, I'm just gonna share some of the, uh, one of um, the publication that we actually started about five years ago. So basically uh, we have actually uh, invented um, a deep learning system for detecting diabetic eye diseases. Uh, in the medical term, it's called diabetic retinopathy. So basically, it is a blinding eye condition that affects all the diabetic uh, populations. So this is the uh, multi-center study that we've done uh, involving uh, different countries, data sets, races, retina cameras, and uh, reference standards as well. I mean, back then, VGG is a uh, pretty uh, popular, you know, as you can imagine, four to five years ago, of course, like over the years, ResNet, DenseNet, uh, you know, the efficient, uh, lots of lots of different neural nets has actually come on board. And um, so um, the um, deep learning system, it was uh, actually uh, developed using close to half a million of images for all three conditions. And then the AUC sensitivity specificity show comparable um, performance um, to the human graders and retina specialists. This is the glaucoma suspect and AMD, both of which are also the potentially blinding conditions uh, from ophthalmology point of view. And it was actually uh, was pu uh, publicly media released and and um, it has currently been actually listed as one of the national AI strategies in Singapore. And we have actually also recently got the, um, the approval the, uh, from both Singapore and the CEMA and also founded a company. And this is currently being used by 26 optometrists across in Singapore uh, through a, uh, the initiative called the Say No to Vision Loss. And um, just coming back to the topic today. So, I mean, the publication came out in 2017 and then the, 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 the research actually started five years ago. So from the five years ago until now, we actually, uh, there's lots of lots of uh, effort has been put into this. And so far we are still uh, did not manage to answer the question whether deep learning is equates to black box. This is actually coming back to uh, bring, uh, bring back to what we are trying to uh, talk about today. Ali Rahimi is one of the very famous, I'm sure a lot of you guys uh, know about this. He actually uh, said something pretty provocative, uh, you know, two to three years ago in, um, in the NIPS, which is the top tier conference as you guys uh, are aware in the deep learning. Basically, he actually said deep learning is, uh, you know, deemed to be an uh, alchemy. Why did he say that? He said, we do not know why some algorithms work and some don't. And then there's no rigorous criteria for choosing one architecture to the other. And some features that we think is really important, but in the computer mind, the deep learning neural net, I, is somewhat become not important anymore. In fact, they're actually finding new findings, you know, in um, some of the images that you actually throw them. So that actually uh, make us feel as if we are operating on an alien technology. That's actually what Ali Rahimi said. Of course, after that, they have a big fight with Yam Lekun and, you know, the groups and, uh, you know, so and so forth. So basically, uh, coming back to the visualization technique, so I'm going to go a, a bit more technical now on explainable AI, X, uh, X, uh, XAI. So as you know, there's a different technique that's actually been used to visualize uh, one of, uh, some of the rational um, that uh, the neural net actually think. So basically occlusion tests, integrated gradient methods, that all the, you know, the, the earlier technique that we're actually using, soft attention techniques. So this is some of the examples that I would like to show. The one that you're actually looking at the top two is the fundus camera. This is where the ophthalmologists are uh, you know, gonna um, see when you, you come into the eye clinic to see us. So these are the changes that actually happens in a diabetic uh, population. AMD is an age-related macular degeneration that often affects the elderly population. The last uh, picture that you see is the patient that has a central swelling around the retina because of the poorly controlled diabetes. That's what we call diabetic macular edema. As you can see, the hemat is showing up the, swell, the swollen uh, portion. So going um, forward, like visualization techniques wise, we know it's nowhere near the mature stage. We, we can use tons of different, you know, 
the techniques to um to to visualize what the neural nets is trying to think. But if if you can see, I try to fit one image through different visualization techniques. Uh, you know, as you can tell, and different visualization techniques will actually give you different results. So this actually also shows the inconsistency between the different visualization techniques that we're trying to use, and. Um, we actually trying to also see whether, you know, in telehealth, internet of things, we are trying to see whether we could use explainability and um, the visualization technique to explain some of the perf performances, you know, that actually was uh, yielded by the neural nets. So basically what we are trying to do is to see whether we can compress the retina images to different compression level. And as you can see from 350 kilobytes all the way down to 150, while retaining the sensitivity, the specificity actually drops significantly. So from 88.8% .8 to 50%. Why is that so? So, I mean, if you actually look at the fundus, the color images, actually between the left and the right picture, you don't actually see any differences. We say, oh no, I mean, what, what, what's the difference? Can you tell? I, I, I don't think any one of the retina specialists can tell any differences between the two image. But if you, when we actually trying to run the uh, AX, um, XAI, and you can see there's a lot of the subtle pixelated changes that is not picked up by the human eye, but it's picked up by the machine. So those, those are the few things that um, I think um, the visualization techniques is actually um, uh, help us in terms of determining what, 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 what is the cause behind all these things. And this is uh, one example to show, if you look at the right side, the grad cam is one of the very popular uh, XAI technique that a lot of people are using. If you actually look at just a green patch, it doesn't mean anything to me. This is something that I wanted to illustrate, right? You can actually say, oh, a lot of um, the papers that I received so far from the, uh, the say, the na in nature uh, journals and stuff, they say, oh yeah, I run this uh, heat map, they show the one or two best, you know, the visualization, the visualized areas. But I say like, have you run hundreds of images and see how accurate is your visualization technique? And more often than not, no one can actually really rebut to that kind of questions. So, I mean, the last slides I want to um, end is, can AI see and explain what we can't see? So I don't know how many of you actually have seen this paper published three years ago, saying that retina fundus photos, uh, similarly to what uh, Wairo has actually just uh, mentioned, how do you use the brain uh, MRI scan or CT scan to predict someone's age? This is exactly what the Google team has done from the Verily team in California. So basically they actually run the retina image and to predict the age, gender, and the cardiovascular risk factors of the patient. And then if I actually asked that in multiple conferences in the top tier retina conferences with the retina specialists around the world. I say, can you actually tell the age or the gender of this patient? Literally zero, right? So, I mean, as you can see, the heat map is showing that the age, the vessels are showing up the changes. The gender is mainly localized in the middle part. If you can see my cursor, that's why we, that, that, that's why we call the macula. So this is a very highly predictive uh, areas for the gender. So, I mean, this is, uh, has been published in the Nature Medical and Biomedical uh, Journal. If uh, uh, those of you are interested, please uh, go ahead and uh, take a look. So basically, as you can tell, the actual age and the predictor age is within the standard deviation that the, you know, the, the Google's team has actually reported. So with this, I would like to thank the organizer again for, for, the, for, for the kind invitation to share. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Ting. And again, thanks for, ma for making the time given everything uh, else going on as well. So I would like to ask you one question too that, that's come in, or there's a few questions I think kind of trying to get at the same thing. And, and again, we can be kind of specific here in the answer that way we have time to discuss things as a group as well. Yeah. Um, but I think in, in your area, the, the ophthalmology area, I mean, you talked about learning as we go, right? So there's a few questions in here about how do we even use assumptions or scenarios or, or validation of kind of what we don't know, right? So maybe you can just, you know, be specific about in your work, what, how you're using assumptions and in, in something like deep learning and, and the validation of the outcomes. Well, I mean, okay. So, I mean, in order to um, embark on the AI research, uh, looking at validations, um, you know, how do you validate uh, the diagnostic performance of the AI studies? I, I, so, the, so the very number one question is, what is the truth? What is the real truth? That's, a, that's, that's actually the one most important thing that actually um, um, that concerns the both machine learning and the clinical world. What is the real truth? Because any AI... Um, algorithms that you're trying to do is to pitch against the gold standard or the standard of 
care. So I mean, that's a, let, let's get uh, let's work through this uh, step by step. This is a question that probably can take me hours to actually go through, but I'll try to make it very concise so that you know we can actually go on to the next question. So I mean, the second uh, step is to um, then to actually. Um, so I mean, the assumptions. There is a quite 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 a few ways that you want to assume about um, the. I, I mean, to, assumptions to me is a very generic, uh, you know, the, the question. So it's really what uh, you are trying to answer on the research question. So to me, I, I just uh, go back to what I was uh, trying to show earlier. If today the, um, the research questions, the answer, the outcome is to detect diabetic retinopathy, yes versus no. And this is the algorithm that we're trying to train to discriminate the presence of the disease versus the absence. So the ground truth will usually come from the retina specialist for checks x-ray, for CT scan, MRI scan, they will all come from radiologists, but for the you know, eye related stuff, you come from the specialist. And when you train, then you have to gather all these clean and organized data sets, and then you, you split in them training, validation, and testing, of course, to avoid any overlapping of the, um, the data sets to prevent the overfitting issues that we all, uh, you know, are well aware about. And then, I mean, following which, I mean, you know, if you look at how you're going to deploy that in the intended use environment, so this is one of the US FDA criteria that actually has been published two years ago. So any AI algorithms in healthcare has to be used in an intended, uh, you know, environment. You cannot just say, oh yeah, let's go to, uh, let, let's go to Kegler, let's assume that this is the environment we're going to test. It's not going to work in the clinical space. So it's very, very important for any AI researchers, um, you know, uh, the audience uh, today to really look at, to work very closely with the clinician to first look at where is a clinical unmet need and design a, a research a algorithm that fits into the you know the clinical environment. So the assumptions usually should uh, start from there. Yeah. So okay. that, that that's my question. Yeah. Uh, that's Thank my you. answers. Yeah. Thank you. And and uh, as you've seen, we've been answering questions as we go, and and we've been typing answers too. So so hopefully that's that's okay for the audience. We're about to open things up completely, but before I do that, we'll call up poll number two. So Jody, if you can call that up, please. So now that you've heard a bit from the panelists about the potential applications of AI and the explainability of AI in the healthcare value chain, um, where do you think is, is the greatest potential, you know, for the, for the application of AI in terms of the healthcare value chain? Okay, a couple more seconds. All right, let's see the answer. Jody, please. Okay, care provision, which makes sense. I think we've been talking mostly about that uh, on the call today. So, all right, bearing that in mind, let's open things up here a little bit to the, to the panelists. So I'm just gonna go back to the Q&A uh, box here. Again, we have already been getting lots of questions, so that's good. I think we'll start off with one here that, that was somewhat related to what I asked uh, Dr. Ting on the end of his, but as it pertains to the, the applications of AI and deep learning and then the millions, billions, trillions of then scenarios and kind of data points that you have to, to use to validate um, you know, the technology being applied, how does that practically work in, in, uh, in what you guys are doing in the applications in healthcare? So whoever would like to start, I think maybe Professor Neeson, this one was kind of had your name on there specifically. So, <laughs> uh, you have, you have sure. to go off. Can you, yeah. repeat, can you repeat my audio uh, field for a second? Sure. So, uh, you know, with the applications of AI and, and deep learning to the healthcare scenarios, you have millions, billions, trillions of data points, right? Scenarios, assumptions being made. So, you know, how does that practically work in your, um, you know, in your work in terms of the validation, that, but the unpredictability of the technology that's being applied? Yeah, so, so I think uh, it's a very good question. I think uh, AI, uh, the, the way we are working uh, right now, we cannot answer very big 
uh, questions in very variable conditions. So we really need to focus in order to really develop an algorithm and know how it performs in certain conditions. You need to clearly specify your, your task, you have to clearly specify to what of group of patients you are applying it. And if you do that, uh, uh, and the current status of AI shows you can build very good algorithms that can perform, a, often we call it narrow AI. So I think uh, uh, you clearly need to focus on a specific task, to collect the data that are representative of daily clinical practice and then show the performance and report on that performance. And that's the only way you can at this moment, I think, re, uh, responsibly introduce AI. So focus and uh, validate and inform the end users of the specifications that come out of your validation. I think Dr. Ting, you answered this a little bit in your part. So Professor Iskab, did you want to take this one as well or another question? Yeah. Yeah, so I think that from computational point of view, having a lot of data is not really a problem for us. Uh, in, in, in medical uh, domain, the problem is more uh, what Professor Misa said, having a lot of data that is uh, covering the clinical practice. And then not only having the data, but having the data with the reference. So with the uh, clinical decisions or some external uh, reference. And that is uh, a problem in obtaining and I think we would even as scientists like to have more and larger data sets for analysis and uh, computationally we can deal with that. This is also somewhat uh, simplified answer. I mean, of course, problem sure. in, in, in medical imaging, for example, medical domain uh, in general is also that we have very high dimensional data and that um, uh, um, that, that does cause problems, uh, computational problems, but we can find an algorithms or design algorithms that are going to deal with that. Uh, so I would rather work on solving that uh, that is in our abilities, I would say. Okay. Let's, let's do uh, another one here. And this is something that was on our, our prepared discussion list too. So it's good we're, we're aligning our, our minds here with the audience. Uh, there's a question, again, I'm going to kind of reword things slightly, but I think it's around sort of false positives. So if we are relying on AI or deep learning to make medical judgments and there's false positives, how do we, how do we deal with that? I think one of the uh, sort of discussion topics we had also prepared in advance, which is related, but the quantification of uncertainty, right? How does that sort of factor into the model? So however you want to take that topic, who would like to start? Go ahead. Yes, yes, so I, yep. think it's, uh, I think it's inevitable that also AI algorithms will have a certain sensitivity and specificity. So it's, it's, it's good to know it because uh, uh, often uh, the AI algorithm are, are just going to provide part of the information because we still have narrow AI. It's, it's not often the case that the output of uh, the AI algorithm is going to say you should do this treatment or not. No, it's just based on the images, we think this is this subtype of tumor or whatever. So it's gonna be weighed with other information. So in weighing the output of the AI algorithm, it will be important to know uh, the sensitivity and specificity of this algorithm in realistic uh, conditions. I think if we move towards algorithms that are going to integrate, integrate more information and have more impact on clinical decision making, then there is an interesting question around uh, liability of course because uh, uh, the moment that the algorithm becomes more autonomous then uh, the question is who is liable it's going to be the clinician or is it going to be the person producing the algorithm uh, from the the radiological society of north america or the american college of radiology they, they submitted a letter to the fda that they feel that by now autonomous ai algorithms should not be uh, sh should at least be uh, watched with very uh, 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 with a lot of care before introducing autonomous AI systems. I think we are a long way away from introducing autonomous AI systems in healthcare. Okay, Dr. Ting. Okay, right. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think that's a very, uh, very, very important question. So, I mean, before we even talk about false pos positive, I just wanted to bring us back to the concept 
Um, and how do we even come up with AUC sensitivity and specificity? So basically, I mean, when we actually decide what is the optimal operating threshold on the training data sets before we lock it on the testing data sets and then deploy it on the clinical space, is something that we actually have to uh, put a lot of thoughts in it. So how do we decide the operating threshold is really to answer a lot of different questions, not just false positive, but how do we not miss the false negative that shouldn't be, you know, that would, could potentially result in site threatening or life threatening conditions. So those are the few balances that we really have to. So of course people would say, so if um, a lot of people ask me these questions, like how do you even decide what is a good threshold to plot? So my, my, my answers generally is firstly, based on the universal clinical guidelines, what is the acceptable standards for sensitivity and specificity in providing a care? Before AI, the human is the one grading the images and we are pitching AI against the human standard. We are not saying that AI is a god. AI can solve 100% of the problem. You're not saying that. Right now, where the AI level is, is at the human, we say it's on par, that is then acceptable for clinical care. Of course, then it, um, then it comes up, uh, brings out the second point. Um, I saw uh, Gary Ang, uh, you know, uh, raise a question, is care too expensive, complex, repetitive? So, I mean, that brings to the second point because I mean, um, for the AI studies, um, our team also runs a health, um, the health economic analysis. So one most important and the most expensive factor to deploy the AI algorithms in the clinical space or in any uh, medical space is the false positive. Because any sing uh, every single false positive results to, uh, into a referral. So the referral from the primary care to the tertiary care, all of a sudden you're talking about not using human graders to grade, but you're asking the retinal specialist in my field or radiologist uh, instead of a radiographer to actually see a patient. So the cost itself actually will go up by like 10 to 100 times depending on the hourly rate rates and the, um, uh, in specific countries. So false positive is something that we really have to uh, be quite mindful about. But before that, we have to make sure the false negative rate is acceptable before we even talk about false positive. Because as a screening algorithm, you cannot miss the site or life-threatening condition. That, that, that is the, as simple as that. So, I mean, then, you know, we can go, uh, you know, to how do we do, like people are using Uden's index to actually determining the operating threshold. For myself, usually I prioritize sensitivity than specificity. Of course, the specificity has to be within the acceptable threshold, but it really depends on the clinical use case and again, the intended use environment. Yeah, back to my uh, that previous point, yeah. Thanks. Professor Iskam, uh, would you like to enter this one? Well, I think that uh, performance has to be uh, very much tuned to the task that it, the, 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 of the use. Uh, so whether sensitivity or specificity uh, are more important, uh, it, re it really depends on the task uh, that is going to be, uh, the software would be used for. Uh, so in screening, maybe it is not that bad to uh, create many um, um, answers that are going to lead to more investigations. Of course, this might lead to more course uh, burden for patients, but it is important to miss, no, not to miss uh, pathology, important pathology, what threatening pathology, but in, yeah, I think this has to be very careful looked at on case basis. Thank you. And for those tuning in, I've been uh, advised by the facilitating parties that we will go 10 minutes after. So that's a surprise to our panelists as well, if you're able to stick around. <laughs> We're just getting so many questions here. So, so we'll do an extra 10 minutes um, for those who are able to stick around. Okay, another, again, I'm going to kind of combine some stuff in here that I think have a similar, uh, you know, theme to address a few things at once. So if each of you could pick one particular use case that you think has the nearest term potential for the applications of what we're talking about here today. So pick one use case. And, and what is the one major way within that use case that you can uh, engender trust in the doctor and the patient kind of relationship, right? And I think a subplot to that is, the trust in the technology versus vis-a-vis -vis what a human would be doing in that situation, right? So one use case and one technique you've seen that engenders trust in that situation. Professor Iskam, would you like to start? I don't mean to make you go last every time. Uh, 
<laughs> okay, it's difficult to choose one. I think in general uh, the potential is uh, the highest on, in the near term on uh, uh, um, automating repetitive cases where the expert can have impact on and correct what are easy to see, uh, where the results are easy to see and correct. But uh, okay, so for example, I have been working, if I have to uh, choose one case, I've been working on uh, for a recalcitrant scoring for detection of uh, cardiovascular risk. So it is important disease, uh, or, or it is important to detect uh, uh, individuals at risk of having, a, for example, heart infarction. Uh, and I think this is a task that can be uh, very quickly uh, put in, in implementation without, uh, let's say, generating uh, very high risk of making uh, huge uh, deadly errors. Okay. Other panelists? Go ahead, Viro. Viro, yep. Yeah, so, uh, um, so one of the use cases we're very interested in at the moment is around um, prostate cancer. Uh, prostate cancer, uh, uh, new research has shown over the last couple of years that if you add multi-parametric MRI imaging in the diagnosis of uh, prostate uh, patients, you can uh, reduce over and under diagnosis. So both uh, over diagnosis leading to unnecessary treatment and under diagnosis missing severe cancers is an issue in prostate cancer. Uh, biopsies are used, but are already invasive. So multi-parametric MRI has the possibility there uh, that will lead to an enormous increase over the next couple of years. But reading these images are, is complex. And uh, uh, we think that there is an enormous opportunity to help uh, radiologists in interpreting these images with AI. And that will not mean initially replacing them, that will be step by step uh, improving the workflow and giving them more security in the analysis of these data. So I think uh, uh, we will see a development of tools that are gonna be increasingly supported by AI to improve the workflow and the accuracy and reduce the number of over and under diagnosis in, in prostate cancer. And I think that it is something that's gonna be feasible over the next couple of years to develop that. Dr. Ting? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with the, the previous uh, mentioned uh, use case. And I mean, of course, I'm a very, I mean, I'm an ophthalmologist. I'm quite biased towards, you know, the eye use case that I've actually presented before. But I mean, to answer the questions, I, I again wanted to use a, a, a broader principle. Like if you ask me what's the lowest hanging fruits, if you can break the AI um, analysis in healthcare to three different big parts, segmentation tasks, classifications and prediction. I think segmentation and classification is the very um, uh, doable field as of now because I think so long as you have a large data sets provided the data sets is clean and then the segmentation task usually, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, classification task, yes, no, that is what we meant by classification task is good. I mean the very few, uh, you know, examples would be the retina, um, you know, um, images for DR screening, prostate cancer that uh, Vero has uh, actually talked about. Um, not sure whether some of you have seen the Google paper on uh, looking at the chest, you know, the, the tumor. There's, um, there's uh, another, um, the checks x-ray on detecting tuberculosis and all these things is actually quite, uh, you know, doable. And, and then in terms of, uh, you know, uh, creating the trust, I think the visualization techniques um, the one of the more popular ones, grab cam, soft, you know, the integrated gradient methods, you know, I, I think those are the, the few, uh, you know, visualization techniques that has helped um, the physicians to really pin down where exactly, you know, the, the, the lesions is. Because in the healthcare settings, I mean, the patients always needs to know the explanation. So you show them a picture, tell them, oh, this is an abnormal area. They'll be more likely to accept that. Same for a lot of the clinicians that do not understand AI. So, so long as they know, based on the clinical experience, this is where the lesion is, computer is showing exactly the same place or roughly the same place, they will be more likely to accept it. Yeah. Thank you. 
Okay, this will be a different type of question, but I think I know why we're getting some in inquiries on this because we do have startups and investors uh, in the audience. So for those of you that sort of are entrepreneurs or kind of wearing, wearing that hat a little bit, a two-part question here. For, for you know startups or entrepreneurs looking to get into the space of the applications of AI and healthcare, what in your mind would make a, a startup very investable? You know, what would make the solution investable? And secondly, what are some of the cost considerations they should have? I mean, all of you have already been working on AI solutions. So maybe you can share some insight on some unanticipated costs you've incurred along the way with this. Dr. Ting, you went last, last time. So I want to go first this time. <laughs> sure. Thanks. Pretty fair, Chris. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, cost. Yeah. Very important. So startup. What is the, the, the cost? Okay, so I mean, the cost can range all the way from data sets, collections. And I, I say like invest in the startup that has uh, already got some, some uh, already got the AI algorithm that has been validated, you know, um, in studies and peer reviewed journals and stuff. So I mean, coming from an investor point of view, if I were to assess the potential, Firstly, market size of the problem, how big the problem is. Are we talking about one in 100,000 patients type problem or are we talking about one in 10? So firstly, market size. Second is the market com competitor. How many companies are really doing that in the field, right? So how, if I were to do something similar, what is my unique advantage and what is the you know, business proposition that you know, one have to think about? That's uh, point number two. Point number three is who is the one, uh, who is the, because if you talk about AI in healthcare, who are the clinicians that are driving this uh, AI algorithm? Are they like legit publications that come out? Because we, we really need to make sure that we don't fall into the hype and stuff, especially in the healthcare setting when we talk about the patients, you know, is something, uh, it, 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 we're talking about life. You're not talking about money that you can lose and then you can earn back, but it's just the life and the eyesight, the sight and stuff for the patient. So I think those are the three main things that I think. The number four thing is to really make sure that the data sets that you have, because sometimes it actually came to surprise. Oh, no, like, you know, you actually have to spend millions of dollars for, you know, to, to actually apply for grants and things to start collecting for data. You don't, I mean, as an investor point of view, that is not, um, that, that, that would not be a very strategic move. Yeah, so that, that's my four points. Thank you, Professor Nielsen. Yeah, that's uh, actually a very comprehensive answer that Daniel gave. Uh, I just would like to highlight indeed, uh, next to market size, etc. indeed, the moment that you start to have a, a, a working prototype and you get really a, a number of different sites, not one single one, but a few sites that are really interested in using uh, the system and giving feedback how to, uh, to work it. I mean, no company will in one go generate a solution that is gonna be uh, uh, excellent. It will create, it will require co-creation with a number of users. But the moment that a number of leading hospitals become really interesting in using the tool and giving feedback you know that there are, that this is this is a tool that it, there is a need for it and then uh, of course if that's a need in a, a big potential market it's much more interesting than when it's a need in a niche market so uh, so i fully agree with the things daniel said thank you professor iskam I think there is not that much for me to add. I fully agree with that. Uh, what I think in our uh, research, and I think that would translate to uh, industry as well, unexpectedly um, much time and their associated costs go into data preparation, into data curation, obtaining, dep depending on the task. But uh, in many cases, uh, we need highly specialized experts to provide us the reference. and. Uh, there is a lot of time and effort that goes into that. And maybe it doesn't seem so super obvious when you're thinking of a solution for a specific uh, clinical problem. All right, and so we'll do one final question here, which I think does kind of wrap all of this together. And there's a, again, I'm gonna kind of combine a few different themes going on, but, but I think there's a lot of questions just around education, okay? So if you're an average person kind of looking to get into this, and this is the whole concept today, right? Explainable AI, AI right? So if you're an average person looking to get into this, um, if you're, uh, let's say an up and coming person going into medical school, right? Uh, 
or I'd like to add this third dimension to it, which is now, now we have robot citizens, right? So not all citizens are human. Some of them are robots. So also the education of the machines themselves and the data available. So, so how do you think this whole topic, explainable AI, how can, you know, where can people learn more? How does this shape the way education kind of data training works? And, and you can take that question however you'd like based on kind of your, your realm, you know? So Professor Iskam, I, I come to you first. So explainable AI in education of engineers and uh, scientists, uh, it should be part of uh, integral part of education. Learning uh, about the AI and how the um, technology works uh, necessarily with it brings uh, aspect of explainability. Directly or indirectly, implicitly or implicitly, it is integral part of it. For medical experts, uh, this is maybe less obvious. I, I think the most important part is understanding what the uh, how the technology, uh, the basics of how the technology works and risks associated with it. So, what uh, understanding the uh, the where the errors may come from, come from, understanding how the evaluation should be performed, uh, is probably more crucial than learning how exactly the technology works. And then I think that extends to uh, also what you said, citizens, understanding where the pitfalls may be and what the risks may be and how the, uh, the, the results uh, should be interpreted. Thank you. Professor Nielsen? Yes. Um, so I, I agree with that point. I think uh, if I take the perspective of an uh, uh, the end user, a clinician, and then you have to look at the curricula the, the, of the medical students. Um, so initially AI was a little bit uh, introduced perhaps uh, because of uh, uh, arrogance of uh, the data scientists as something that would replace uh, uh, humans. And more and more we know that AI is going to uh, augment humans. Uh, so it's also gonna augment clinicians in order to deliver more efficient uh, care to deliver care in, in more places. So there's a huge opportunity, but this opportunity will only uh, be realized if the clinicians are able to, uh, to, to know what, are, what is the value of the technology and what are the limitations of the technologies. So an integral part of uh, becoming a doctor means you are going to be the one responsible for the diagnosis, for the treatment. AI is gonna help you in that. So you need to be trained to, to make responsible use of this technology. So both for the introduction of AI and for its routine use, you need to understand uh, uh, how it works, why it works, when it cannot work, what could be issues, etc. And this needs a total change in the curriculum. And uh, luckily there are a, a lot of initiatives. I'm not sure, I'm, I'm not, uh, uh, very knowledgeable about this uh, situation in Singapore, but I know in the EU there is this digital doc curriculum. People are defining new uh, endpoints, things that uh, doctors really would need to know when they enter training. And I think we need to invest in that in order to make sure that this technology is used to the benefit of patients and citizens. Hey, Dr. Ting, final words here. Yeah, final words, yeah. <laughs> All right, um, yeah, I mean, this is something that is really close to my heart. Um, AI educations, um, I mean, there's a few prongs. One is to the patients, one's to the clinicians, and of course, the, the last one, which is, I think, is the, the most important, the next generations. Like, how, how do we really make sure that AI and deep learning ML or the, even the new techniques, um, you know, um, can be taught um, as if it's going to be like a static, uh, statistic class or something like that, right? Because 10, 15 years ago when we started medical school and stuff, everyone had to uh, learn all the statistics. How do we get everyone to learn AI deep learning moving forward, you know, medical school curriculum and stuff? Um, so th those, are, those are the next generation part that I wanted to touch upon before I um, um, go back to the patients, uh, educations and physicians. And, and then, in fact, um, you know, globally for ophthalmology, at least, we are also uh, thinking how we could actually uh, start writing chapters into the, um, the ACGME, you know, the U.S. residency, the textbook, and then 
uh, even uh, we are trying to even push for some of these knowledge to be assessed, you know, during the residency program and stuff. So, I mean, how do we really make sure the next generation has the has enough knowledge to embrace, you know, and welcome the new technology and be able to critically assess, you know, the technology, um, you know, like how we assess the new drugs and technology in the past. Same thing applies to AI. So, I mean, going uh, the second point is. How, how then do we use AI as an assistive tool for the physicians? In fact, like uh, one of the papers that um, similar similar to the the the, the comments that I made earlier about the false positive health economy analysis, actually the best economic values that was yielded um, by the combinations of human intelligence and um, and artificial intelligence. So how do you um, make this hybrid approach how do you uh, achieve a win-win situation when you can use ai to get rid of the things that you really hate to see the repetitive normal stuff you don't want to see and then and then focus your attention and your expertise in some of the patient that really needs to have a detailed assessment so ai actually really uh, able to really change the job scope from the more simplified one to a more complicated one for human, where, where else it can actually take care of all the mass bulk of the simplified things that we know it exists in the screening setting. So, I mean, those are the few uh, different things that we are actually talking about. And then it does make a lot of the health economic sense as well. Yeah. Thank you. And, and uh, many thanks to all of you. As I said from the beginning, great that we're able to share like this internationally on such an interesting topic. Um, I saw in the chats some things we didn't get to are, are many people working on specific use cases already of AI in healthcare. So for those people, keep it going. Uh, let's keep the conversation going. Uh, I'm sure you know people are happy to connect with each other. In fact, the poll at the beginning said pretty much everybody on this call is working with AI on a, AI on a daily basis now. So we're not alone. As I said at the beginning, one positive outcome of the whole pandemic is I think health literacy will go up. Um, organizations focused on healthcare will go up. So we've got all the right fundamentals that we need to really make this scalable. Uh, but it's about trust. I mean, we talked a lot about that on the call today. Trust is integral to healthcare and it's even more integral with these new technologies. Um, and so we talked about healthcare as a basic human right, but also understanding AI as a basic human right as well. So that was the kind of core today. Um, and, and most people were primarily interested in the care provision side, maybe because that's top of mind. Uh, at the moment, but inter again, we talked about some good use cases sort of across the board. So uh, maybe just quickly, we'll do the final poll here to see how good of a job we've done with the panel today. So maybe Jody, you can call that up. Based on everything you've heard today, when do you think explainable AI, so not just AI, but explainable AI can achieve scalability in, in healthcare specifically? Never less than five years or five to 10 years. Okay, we are hopeful. Not to influence everybody's answers, but we are hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> A few more seconds. Okay, let's see the results. Less than five years. All right, so moderately optimistic. I love the, uh, the, the Microsoft quote that we always overestimate a bit what's gonna happen in the near term, but we tend to underestimate what's gonna happen in the kind of you know, mid to longer term. So um, you know, we'll see how things go. With that, I hand back to the organizers, SG Innovate, close us out here. Thanks. Thank you very much, Chris and Ivana Wero, as well as Daniel for that conversation. We have been receiving a lot of interest from our audience members for the uh, recording of this session, which we will be sharing with everyone uh, through a post-event email, which will also contain certain materials that the speakers may like to share with you on resources that are available on, the, for example, education or explainable AI in health. So stay tuned for that. And uh, with that, I would like to now uh, invite uh, Astrid as well as Marus to join us for a quick uh, photo shoot here uh, as we end off the session. And thank you everyone uh, for joining us uh, uh, until today. Marus, are you still here with us? No? I, 
I think she might have dropped off, but let's just continue here. Uh, Jody, could you help us, please? Okay, so everyone, I'll need your help to look at your um, video camera. Don't look at the screen, so look straight in the camera. Now count down from three. Maybe we could all do a sign, or you can just give your brightest smile. Okay, three, two, one. Okay, one more. Three, two, one. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you all. Have a good uh, day ahead in uh, the Netherlands, Miro and Ivana and uh, Malus as well. And uh, have a good evening, Chris, Daniel and Astrid. See you guys. Everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.